much for, for coming back. Um, hope you caffeinated up and you're ready to learn some stuff. Um, we have we have uh, here Jeff Bazanson and um, Stefan Karpinski. Um, they're going to be teaching us a bit about um, another interesting language, Julia. So, thank you. Hi, it's uh, great to be here. We uh, we came last year and talked a little bit about Julia, and at that point, it was all promises. It was all. Um, you know, we could potentially have a lot of interoperability between Python and Julia, but this year we're happy to say that we actually have a fairly crazy amount of interoperability, some of which uh, Fernando actually demonstrated in his talk, so we had to change a couple of examples last minute, but um, that's okay. I'm going to talk a little bit first. I'm Stefan. This is Jeff. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit first about uh, why you might want to use Julia. Um, because obviously Python is, you know, what, what we're here for at, at a, as a conference and, you know, most of you use Python for doing scientific computing. Um, one of the selling points of Julia, is, of course, is performance. Um, we generally get in the, you know, in the range of between 1 and 2x uh, of C code for just sort of writing high-level code the same way you would normal Python code. You can do that with a lot of, you know, various tools in Python, though. You know, you can use... Uh, you know, obviously PyPy doesn't really operate very well with SciPy, but you can use things like Cython um, and various other things that we're going to hear lots about at this conference. Um, but there's other things that are kind of nice about Julia that I'm going to talk about here. So I have three of them listed up here on my very ad hoc text-based slide. It's the only slide we have in our entire talk. The rest is just code. Um, so. One thing is having a nice type system. Uh, and we, we kind of know that we need type systems for science. Scientific computing is one of those places where suddenly, like, this whole idea of, like, dynamic languages without any way of talking about types starts to kind of fall apart. Um, because we need to be able to do things like, say, I have this array of stuff, and I know they are all floating point integers. They're exactly 64 bits, and they're immutable, and I want you to lay them out in a particular way. Um, so, you know, what, it, what ends up happening is that all the, all the various sci, SciPy, you know, packages in the SciPy umbrella have developed their own ways of expressing that kind of thing. Um, unfortunately, this leaves you in a situation where you have a, a lot of different type systems. Uh, the nice thing about Julia is that it has built in a type system that is actually very sophisticated and very powerful, and the compiler knows how to make great use of that information. So just as an example, um, here is the actual definition of the complex type in Julia's type system. Uh, th this is not, you know, like a mock-up. This is exactly what we, this is from the source code. Um, so it's defined in Julia itself, so there's no C code involved here. And you just say immutable, which is, uh, you can define mutable or immutable types. Ty type gives you an immutable type. Numbers, usually you want them to be immutable, because it's defined by its value. I can talk about that a little bit more, but it might be sidetracking. So basically what this says is complex is got one type parameter, which is some real, real type. Uh, a complex is a, t a type of number. And it's got these two fields, real and imaginary, which are of that type. Um, so, you know, this is pretty straightforward. You can just make a complex number, one and two. And you can see the type of that thing. So that's a complex number of type int 64. So immediately you see something here that kind of, you know, the, 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 the parametric business gives you actually a lot of power. Um, you can already do things like, you know, a complex number of, you know, that's, that's floating point. This is actually a completely different type. Um, but, you know, they'll, they'll interact. And also this... Uh, this notation works works smoothly, so you can do something like this, and that'll all work. Um, so what's interesting about this is that you can, you know, so you can you can access. So let's just call this guy Z. Um, so you can access the fields of Z. Um, you can't assign to them. And this is, you know, this sounds like a limitation, but it's actually really handy. Um, because if you th imagine what, what we would do here, if this thing was mutable and you assigned to Z, 
uh, and then you change the field of z, you'd get w changing out from under you, and that's like not the way numbers work, right? A number is defined by, by its identity, its value is its identity. If you change the field of a number, it's not, it's a different number, it's not the same number, just modified. Um, but it also allows us to do things like, like representing these very efficiently. So if you do size of z, you can see that it's exactly 16 bytes. So it is, you know, it is just laid out in memory as two eight, eight, byte, eight byte floating point numbers. Um, you know, you can also do things like uh, i plus plus two pi times m for uh, okay. So now we have an array of complex floating point numbers. Uh, so call that guy A. Okay, so because these guys are immutable, we also can lay those out in memory compactly. So now this is exactly, you know, two times eight, which is the size of a complex number, times the size of this guy, 10, 160. So of course you can do all this stuff in NumPy. Um, the thing, the advantages you get here are just that it's really easy to, to, to do user-defined things. So you don't have to write any C code. Um, and also just that the compiler can give you all these beneficial things like an entire lattice of types just from one single type de declaration. Um, so I'm just gonna show you a little other cool stuff you can do. Uh, for example, mo so I don't have to sell, back to my text slide here, um, I don't have to sell the Python community on the power of polymorphism. It's really nice to be able to write Python code and just you know not really talk about types and just apply exactly the same code through du duct typing to various other types. You can get a little more discipline here um, in Julia because you can actually annotate what the types something applies to are and get you know, runtime type checks. But the real power comes in with multiple dispatch, which is where you can actually say in, you know, particular, you can define particular methods for various combinations of types of arguments. Um, and I'll give some examples of that. I mean, so the classic, you know, the classic, classic thing here is just the, the plus operator, I mean, it's, hugely polymorphic. If you just look at the plus, the methods of plus, you know, there's all these different things. These are all just different combinations of ways of adding different things. Uh, some of them are generated, some of them are generic. Um, you know, another interesting one, this, this one is particularly interesting, the power operator is particularly interesting because you want to be able to do things like, you know, uh, you know, take a take a, a matrix and raise it to an integer power. There's a little bit of a delay there. That's because we're JIT compiled. So the first time it, you know, it's like, oh, I haven't I haven't raised any matrices to powers. So, you know, second time it's fast. Um, <clears throat> this has all sorts of special cases. Uh, I mean, the special cases come in where if you're doing it with an integer power, you want to do special things like, um, you want to use uh, power by squaring, so you don't have to do additional work that you wouldn't otherwise have to do. We can actually, you know, we can we can do this. We get a little bit of overflow if we apply the big operator that. Oh, eh. Okay, so you see you got big ints and you raise them to huge powers. Uh, that would have taken a lot longer if we weren't doing power by squaring, right? So that's that's kind of nice. Um, we also get kind of fun stuff, you know, there's cases where you're like, well, okay, if I want to do this by a floating point number, um, ooh, stack overflow, this is the fun part of doing it live. <laughs> see if that works. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, if you don't occasionally get a stack overflow, you're not going fast enough. Um, so anyway, this is just a taste of the things you can do with Julian. I'm going to hand it over to Jeff, and he's going to show you all the cool interop we have these days with Python. All right, hi everybody. Uh, so I'm mostly going to be presenting other people's work, actually. Uh, most of what I'm going to show is possible through a 
Julia package called PyCall that's largely written by Steve Johnson. Uh, many of you might know as one of the authors of FFTW that uh, NumPy and everybody else uses. Uh, so this, this is our, our Python interop package where you can, you can say using PyCall. Uh, and now right, right away I can start importing Python modules into Julia and using them. Uh, so if we say py import, uh, see I can import numpy and I can even say as np. Uh, this, this at sign thing is Julia's macro invocation syntax. So it, it looks a little bit like uh, an IPython uh, magic, uh, but it's actually part of the language. It's a, it's a syntax hook that lets you basically customize uh, the syntax of the expressions that come after it. Uh, so he used that to, to provide this sort of Python-like syntax. So it will do that. Uh, and it does a bunch of stuff behind the scenes to hook everything up, so you can you can right away just start using it. I can say np.sign, and that will call numpy's sign function. Uh, and so by default here, it will it will do uh, translations both ways for you. So it'll 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 translate the Julia number to Python, and then the Python result comes back, and it'll translate it to a, a Julia number. So you could plug this right into a, a Julia program. Uh, but there are other things you can do as well. Uh, I can actually I can access the Python object directly. So here, so see this gave me back a pi object uh, that you can see is a ufunc. Uh, and so this is now basically a, a Julia side pointer to the, the Python object as it exists. Uh, and then you can do operations on that. Uh, like for example, I can call it through that. And so this syntax, this pi call, uh, lets me put a return type on there. So it did the same thing, but if, if I, I, I can put this type on here that, so that if I put this in a, in a Julia program, we'll actually know the, the return type of this and it can generate fast code uh, around it. Uh, you can do a lot more than just the sign function. So I can say pi built in, let's get the, let's get the dict, uh, Python dict function, uh, and I can pass it keyword arguments, just like in Python. Uh, and I think that'll work. Yeah, so that, uh, that actually called Python's dict function and then it, uh, it copied it back to a, to a Julia dictionary. Can you show but, the type of that thing? Uh, yeah, good idea. So you can see that's a, that's a Julia dict. Uh, but what's really cool is you can, actually, uh, you can actually leave the dictionary in place as a Python object and not copy it um, by doing it this way instead. I think this is how you do it. Uh, oh no, oh right, I need to say pi call. Pi call of that. Hmm. Let me check my cheat sheet here. Uh, uh, yes, thank you, Fernando. <laughs> okay, so there, uh, there I made I made a dict, and this this stays a pi object. So this is actually still uh, this is still in uh, the Python interpreter memory. Uh, it hasn't been copied. Uh, so now I can do something something pretty cool with this. Is I can I can construct a, a pi dict. So the pi call package provides this Julia type pi dict uh, that I can use to wrap that. And so now this will behave pretty much exactly like a dictionary uh, in in Julia. Uh, but even better than that, I can actually, if I want to, I can I can supply types here. So I could say this is actually a dictionary from symbol to int. And that is, see it's a pi dict symbol in 64. And so that is basically a, a Julia strongly typed wrapper around the, the Python dict object that is, that's in memory. Uh, so you can, you can write uh, Julia code around this and it will actually know the types of everything. Uh, so it, it can generate really fast code, but all operating on the Python dictionary in place uh, in memory. Uh, and this, this interoperates really, really smoothly. Uh, so as, as a cool example, so say let's call that D, uh, if I have a Julia function that takes keyword arguments, so in Julia the syntax for that is that keyword arguments come after semicolon, uh, so let's say A and B, so 
So I could actually pass that dictionary as keyword arguments to this Julia function, and it just works. So it's really, really nice interop. And this is all because of, of Steve, Steve's work and several other people in, in the community. Uh, ah, of course, you know, a major thing you want to be able to do is, is plot things. Uh, why not call matplotlib? That is the premier way to make plots, I believe. So we can just pi import pylab. Uh, and do pylab plot. And show it. And there you go, you get, you get your plot. So that is cool. Uh, I think the syntax yeah. is similar enough between Julia and Python that it's not really confusing to anyone to use slightly different calling. All right, now in my other, uh, other shell here, uh, I have checked out a copy of the Julia IPython project, which uh, many thanks to Fernando, who's been, uh, who did a great job of helping us get going with this and uh, who sat us down and we had a nice uh, couple of fun hacking sessions putting this together. Um, and so we can, do, uh, we can do some cool stuff from within uh, Python. So if I start IPython in there, uh, and do load ext julia.magic, so now I have a, basically a Julia kernel, uh, the Julia library running inside uh, my Python session and I can talk to it and, and do things with it. So as, as one example of, of something you might do, so Julia has, uh, has in its library uh, some pretty nice functions for dealing with structured matrices. Uh, so we can, we can show how you might call some of those. So say I have a, so say I have a, what happened? I pushed the make the window tiny button. <laughs> Why is that one key on the keyboard? <laughs> I don't want to make the window tiny button. All right, so let's say I have a, a diagonal and, a, and an off diagonal, just random vectors. So now say I want, uh, say I want to use these as a, as a representation of a symmetric tridiagonal matrix. Um, so I can, I can make a function uh, that will do something with that in Julia just by, by using our, our Julia magic. So I can say, ma just make a Julia function Julia, function of A to B, let's say compute the eigenvalues of sim tri diagonal, the sim tri symmetric tri diagonal matrix constructed of those arguments. All right, so now that is a, so that's a pi call wrapped function and I can just call it on my vectors and I get the answer. So that's really cool. Yeah, there's a very rich system of uh, matrix types in Julia um, that um, Viral Shaw, who's one of the project, Julia Cup project co-founders, and uh, Andreas Jackson have been working on, uh, and Doug Bates, and it's just really impressive stuff. Oh yeah, I'll just, I'll just show this off a bit more because this is fun. So someone, uh, this guy Andreas recently wrote a sort of general purpose uh, sort of matrix factorizer expert so you can say, just you know, give it some matrix and just say factorize it. And so it'll pick something. So in this case, you see it returned an LU factorization. But if I say A transpose A, then it gave me a Koleski yeah. and, and so on. Or if I do, uh, if I just give it identity matrix and it says, well, that's a diagonal matrix. What more do you want? <laughs> that's good. That's factorized enough already. You do the A transpose but, plus A. I don't even know what I, the, oh, yeah, this the is a bunch Kaufman. This triggers some, uh, let's see. Yeah, there's, there's something else in there that I don't, I don't even know what that one is. That's out, out, outside of my linear algebra knowledge. But uh, all right, so that's, that's basically it. And I guess I'll take uh, questions. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh, yeah.
Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, we have uh, yeah. Every everything is abstract interfaces, so you can. Okay. The, qu oh. the question was, can you use Julia to access data that's represented in other ways, be it like example as, you know, in a database or something like that? Yeah, so everything is done through abstract interfaces. So people define, you know, new array-like types and, and things like that all the time, yeah. And in fact, I mean, one, one such type is actually NumPy array. So we have a Julia type for NumPy arrays that keeps the, the storage, you know, in place and accesses it. Uh, yeah. Uh, the question is, is there a library you can use inside your libraries to call Julia? Uh, so yes, so the, uh, the, the Julia magic is loading, there, there's a libjulia, you know, dot so, uh, and it's just loading that up and making API calls, sort of just like how Python has a C API. Our C API, API is much less developed than Python's, but it's, you know, it will, it will develop. So, a few more questions, can I get the next author to come up, please? Uh, yeah. Name, oh, namespaces has been in completely there for like at least a year. No, that's we not have, quite true. We, is it? It's pretty much true. We have, you mean, you mean, you mean, <laughs> yeah, no, you, you mean Julia, Julia namespaces? Yeah. Yeah we, ha, yeah, we have modules and we, yeah, we use yeah. them all the time. Yeah, we have lots of them. Yeah, total, yeah, totally there. It was, it was the, it was the year, uh, that's just wrong. Um, it was the year part I was objecting to. It's been like nine months or something. I don't know. Oh, yes, yeah. So any more questions, you should take offline. But okay, thank you. Thanks, Peter.